So, hello, it's me again. <laughs> yes. Uh, I was actually like falling right now because there are a lot of newcomers arriving. So I will try to make it not that boring for you, but there is some interesting different stuff going on. So just before I start, there is a, error, a, bit, a small error in the program. I'm not the single author for this paper. Once again, I was working on this paper in collaboration with Fontaine Bernard Bertrand Hivé when I was a PhD candidate. Now I'm a postdoc at Enria Han, so just to make sure it's clear. So. We are again on brain-computer interfaces. And now it's something maybe very common for you, that is, maybe you recognize this little scene, a master Yoda saving the ship of Luke Skywalker from the river, only using the force, the force of his brain. He stays very focused and he makes an uh, RDD2 and Luke Skywalker very happy about this because they are not capable to do it. So this was done like 50, 60 years ago from now. Yeah, we see that he is excited. Unfortunately, once again, it's not possible. There is no triumphal music like now we are hearing because we cannot today do it. We are not here, unfortunately. Once again, it's super complicated to deal with these uh, brain signals because more or less we don't even know how some parts of the brain still function. We still have a lot of things going on in neuroscientific community to deal with. Once again, the technology is still uh, mostly reserved for people with disabilities. Uh, so. Here, once again, I will not go into the details about how it works because this is the pr principle of the BCIs I'm using is the same. It's based on the electroencephalography in this case. So we acquire the signals, we do some signal processing to extract the features, we classify them, and so that the user can use them in the, the applications he or she desires. So um, what we ca actually can distinguish in the brain. I have told that a mental state of the user in my previous talk was those who was with me from the beginning. So we can say if a person is stressed, depressed, excited. Yeah. We can say, for example, if I'm going to tell you, oh, it has been quite a talk, I really need some coffee with milk now. Okay, you understand the phrase, there is no problem. But if I'm going to tell you, I want a coffee with a cat, 400 milliseconds later, in the brains of all of you, there is a very particular signal that will appear. It is called N400. N stands for negative 400 because it appears in the brain 400 milliseconds later. Because the phrase that I just made is not correct. It doesn't really exist coffee with a cat. And as for the active BCIs, okay, there is a possibility to imagine the hand movements, feet movements, I have, as I have just told you, for those who stayed with me. But we, cannot, uh, we can actually imagine quite a lot of things. For example, we can imagine a cup of coffee, or we can imagine a cat. Why not? So it's still a focus uh, in my work. And it's still a focus, uh, it's still important for us to have a synchronous uh, setting where the cue is given, so we make sure the user knows how uh, and when he or she needs to start imagination, but a synchronous setting is in privileged because it is really the focus for the human-computer interaction applications, where a user is free to imagine at whatever point he or she desires we still deal with training. I have just presented you that uh, training could be quite tricky. Let's see another example of the training applications. Here we ask a user to imagine left hand movement or right hand movement, and we are given the cures, so it's a synchronous system in this case. The cures are represented by the arrows that are pointing on the right, on the left, on the right. And in the blue bars are the feedback we are giving to a user about his specification accuracy, meaning the bar is changing in real time to indicate if the user is performing well and not well enough. Here on this image we can see that he's performing quite well, at least better, for the left hand movement imagination than for the right one. Once again, <coughs> here, to make this system work for two actions, for left and right hand movements, a user needs to imagine a left hand movement and right hand movement for 10 minutes, staying with this black screen and red arrows and then blue bars for 10 minutes. It could be quite tiring, quite bored, and quite demotivating. So 
What about to propose some maybe more adapted training paradigms? Let's say, okay, we have seen arrows, but arrows are not really related to a task of hand movement. So let's say we want to again to make a play. And this time it will be a first person shooter game. Let's see, it will be um, a weapon, which is very common uh, thing to have in the first person shooter game. And let's say a flashlight. And we want to use it to uh, imagine these two objects in order to control a game. So instead of having arrows, we can use the actual images of the weapon and of the flashlight, like here. So it actually makes the um, training potentially uh, more adaptable because at least uh, user sees what he's going to imagine. It's not an arrow anymore. We can even maybe do better. We can do something like explicit training, but let's just take a game and we will Im embed this training into the game. So we will just mark the whole training and we will have a session where a user needs to train the system before he's actually starting to play. It will have nice designs. Here we are training our flashlight. It's written precisely what needs to be done. And then the user will start playing. It looks not bad. But it's still, it's explicit. And it's like even if it is in the game, within the game, and we do all our designs properly, it's still a, bi it's still a bit artificial. And actually there is a way to mask all this, to hide all this training altogether. It is called priming. Priming is a technique when we present users with a stimulus prime in order to modify the response to a later stimulus probe. So what I'm talking about? Okay, awesome, great, fantastic. It's just the best thing I have ever seen. I can continue like this for around 10 minutes, only using positive words. And then I'm going to ask uh, whatever person from the room, whatever question, the chance that you're going to answer me positively or you're going to use the words I was just using is very high. Or let's see, you have seen, you are watching a movie and you have seen a Coca-Cola. And then you are getting thirsty and you go to Walmart to buy something. The chance that you will end up with Coca-Cola in your bag is very high. So the question is, Will this priming work for the brain-computer interfaces training? So if we will try to use the story of the game to integrate the priming stimuli in order to perform the BCI training, will it actually work and how should we do it? This is how it can happen. For example, if we are having our flashlight and our weapon, we can put a user directly into the game. It's a dark, dark corridor. And then suddenly, without any indications, we will give him a flashlight. We will not tell him to imagine it at any point before. There will be no indications on the screen that he needs to imagine or think about it. Not at all. We will just suddenly give him a flashlight in the dark corridor. And we will capture the signals. This will be our training process for the system. And then we will put him again at some time later in the dark corridor. Will he actually think about the flashlight? Because he got it at some point before. Is there any chance he will, without once again telling him explicitly, will rethink about it? Will he like say, well, I got it somehow. I have no idea how. What should I do with the flashlight? If the brain signals at least resembles a bit, we will give him a flashlight again. So this is how the system is trained, and this is how all the uh, functioning of the game will happen. So we integrated this using the uh, game called Doom 3. So we were authorized to use the source code of the first initial level of the game where the story starts. It's called Mass Underground, the first level. We had 36 subjects with moderate game experience. We made sure not uh, sp to spoil them with Doom 3 so they didn't play it, but yes, they knew what is Doom, and of course they all play Doom and the first person shooter games. And we integrated three types of training. The one that is uh, look like a baseline, so it's really out of the game. We have just images of the two actions, a flashlight and a weapon. The one that is really integrated into the game, it's explicit because there are precise notions what to do, but it mimics the whole design of the Doom level, uh, initial level. And the third one, implicit one, where the training is actually a priming of the user. So here, as the priming is very 
fast response of the brain. It usually takes on between 50 milliseconds to 500 uh, or 1,000 milliseconds. We were obliged to use this one single trial system. So it was the system I presented to you. So for those, for most of you who stayed in the room, it was a uh, 1,000 um, uh, epochs with overlap of 200 milliseconds, and then there was fast ICA, fast independent component analysis applied on the system. And then we uh, were looking for the distance uh, between the average epoch and the reference we got. So how does it look in the game, actually? It looks like this. So this is a Doom 3. It's a part of the trailer. And then the training starts. The explicit training will start right now. So a user needs to, oh, sorry, let's start again, there's a problem. So yeah, this is a doom, this is how it looks. And we will start with explicit training. So a user knows that he needs to imagine there are indications on the screen to visualize the flashlight, he goes to the next level, there is a weapon on the next level, and then when it's done, he can start the game. Implicit integrated training starts the level right away, as it is in the game. Users were not taught why the headset is on their head. It was told that they will just capture some motions. Here is the training of the flashlight, a dark corridor, and we gave them a flashlight. So now the class of the weapon, it was a zombie, obviously, it was a monster. So the, it appears and we are giving them the weapon. And now it's up to them to uh, go through this initial level. There are six zombies in total on this initial level. It's quite easy. So it's quite easy. You can see here that he, they successfully got their weapon because there was a monster. Here it's quite dark, so there was a need of the flashlight and it passes to the next level, and there is again a monster, and they successfully change it for a weapon. Once again, no indications were given at any point that they need to do something, to imagine something, to, to get this weapon and to get this flashlight. There is only uh, partially the result that I'm going to present you. First, in the blue, there is a baseline training that was completely outside of the game. In green, there is a training that was explicit but embedded into the game. And in yellow, this is a training that was using priming. So as for accuracy and time, accuracy and time, as we can see, is actually quite same. It's quite OK. There is no out or over performance in the systems. It's around state-of-the-art numbers of 65 to 70%. As for the time, classification time, it was uh, much longer for the uh, systems that was based on the baseline version, that is version completely out of the game. If you will see on the two versions of the explicit training into the game and implicit training uh, based on priming, they were performed almost the same, it just a bit better with the classification time. Here, if you will see uh, the uh, immersion flow and competence, something we were interested in, how the users felt uh, if their competence were changed, if they were really immersed and in the flow of the game. We can see here that competence uh, stayed on the same level. Actually, it's logical because they didn't feel and there were no big changes in the accuracy. So it was all okay. But there are big changes in everything that is related to, for example, immersion. We can see that uh, the users were really immersed with the version that is priming one. And finally, for the flow, we can see that, once again, baseline didn't uh, get really any flow as much. But uh, really, priming versions are showing the best results for immersion and flow. What was very interesting as well is the opinions of the users. It was not perfect. The brain-computer interface is not working on 100 classification accuracy. But what they liked, and one of the comments I get, which is the most often I get this comment, when they were done, they were saying, can you please do these same versions for other games? And I was telling them, but you didn't. It, it is not working it, like a real game. You know, you have your touchpad, trackpad, a mouse. And they were like, yeah, but we already played all these games, and we know them. 
it's it's really adding a new level. Uh, it's it's kind of a challenge. I would like to replace them. I would like to play Half Life like this and some other things. So this is something interesting, uh, something to be taken into consideration, especially when designing the brain computer interfaces nowadays, because they are not given a classification of accuracy of 100%. So any way we can somehow manage to help a user to undergo the training, to get the things that are of our interest in, in this case, the training that was hidden is uh, of uh, most importance. So idea of implicit training is actually leave the potential of adaptation to other BCI paradigms. It was an example with the priming, but we can hopefully design something that is using motor imagery. I was talking just before in my previous talk. The implicit integration le led to better immersion and flow and making these experiments less substitutive and more satisfying for users. Thank you for your attention. Yes, hi, uh, Brian Hall from the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. I uh, did want to tell you I really enjoyed both of your talks. They're probably my favorite ones that I've attended this week. So <laughs> you give a great presentation. I, um, but uh, with that said, um, you showed a, a lot of different uh, materials on the caps, so a lot of different channels. And yep. I know that some people look at um, using all available channels and learning off all of them, while some use only, they identify a few channels that are most interesting. Mm -hmm. And I wondered what uh, method you use in this study. So uh, thank you for your question. It's a good one. So for this experiment, and actually for the previous one as well. We were using the GTEC amplifier, so it's a medical, high quality medical amplifier. And I'm not, as it is for human computer interaction, I'm not a fan if it is possible to avoid overcharging a person with a lot of cables and channels. This is what I'm really for. So in these experiments, we, do, we did some offline tests a long time before. So it's used, it is using 14 to 16 electrodes, and I'm using all of them. So uh, for, for both of the experiments you have heard, I'm using all of them. I find this gives the best, uh, the best results. Of course, there are quite a few papers telling that for motor imagery, the, uh, the most affection is more about a CP3, C3, C4, etc. But with this program, with the architecture I have designed, I found that this uh, setting of 14 is giving the best results. Awesome. Um, <laughs> so really nice research. Um, I especially liked on the second paper with this implicit training, the fact that it's sort of generalizable, and even though you had it for a game, um, there's no real reason that you had to limit yourself. So what would you sort of see as the next step for users to be able to do this for everyday tasks? Or I need um, to spoil my uh, ongoing paper. Oh, no, no, sorry. <laughs> but no, it's OK. Yeah. I mean, I can take this one. I mean, it's actually very logical that it is in the game. But uh, as I have told, there, uh, there is a very big avenue also to do it in real life. This is really um, interesting. And there are some domains, for example, uh, home automation for people with disabilities that is not done. This is what we are going for, for really. So actually the principle is the same. We just need to show the, to pay the attention to users at some point to some objects, for example, for a tea kettle. And then actually the priming is done. And we can see if it will be enough. The actually most complicated here is it is a real setting. So there's really a lot of things going on. It's how if it will actually work um, correctly with one single trial because what we are designing now it's to have a system that uh, will be can be general generalized to several trials. But yeah, actually there is no point it's not work because this is how we are doing. We are primed in our lives. You can agree with me all the time with Coca-Cola, with some scenes, with the words we are talking, with the scenes when we are paying attention. This is, is why not to use brain is already, our brains are already processing all this information all together. Why not to have the classifier to do the job better? Thank you once again.